I'm afraid the joke is on us as servants of Christ. So often as young Christians, we're tempted to believe that he doesn't work through other groups. And then we go along and we're, you know, humbled a little bit. And we're shocked and surprised to believe the grace of God that he works through those other groups. And then we go on a little further and a little more humility. And then we become as amazed that he works through us as amazed as we are that he works through those other groups. <laughs> and so, you know, after a while, we, we learn that there is no credential there, but only Christ and, and what he's done. Well, if I could have maybe just about 20 or 30 minutes of your time this morning, if, uh, if you'd like to put a finger over in the book of 2 Corinthians and then find also, I think it's the 14th chapter of Matthew. But I want to share something with you today in regards to finding a treasure among your trials and rising above the wind and the waves. We've been talking about this since we began uh, the book of 2 Corinthians because so far that is what it's been primarily about and Paul writing to them and identifying that they have struggles and trials and he shares with them also of his own personal experience and walk in the Lord and service in ministry that he's well acquainted with trials and struggles and tribulations but the question is is how do we do it and how do we go through it it's very easy to identify yes there are troubles but if you look closely and you watch around you even watch among the church you find that not a great number really learn to walk through them in the grace and the power of god and i want to just start by taking a look at something the, the account of Peter walking on water in the book of Matthew, chapter 14, starting in verse 22. He said, and immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead. He, he directed them into a troubling time, intentionally. And, you know, he did that. He made them get into the, into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side, and he sent the multitudes away. And after he had sent the multitudes away, he went, up to the mount, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already many stadia away from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Now, I like a little detail it gives in the account in Mark that he said, and when he saw them rowing, <laughs> strenuously rowing, like, wait, wait a second, here they are miles away, and he's in the mountain, but his eye was on them. And that's the very thing, you feel lonely, and you find yourself down a road that, of troubles and stri uh, of hardships and trials, and that you find yourself in a very lonely position. And you can't necessarily go to those around you, and you can't necessarily find the comfort that you're hoping to find in another person, and you're very much directed to God, which is a, a purpose, <laughs> the intention of that trial. And, no, and you feel lonely, you feel abandoned, and you say, where is God? And you're like, Job, I just wish I could have a conversation with God. You know, so I could ask him why. <laughs> I could ask him what's up. But his eye was on them rowing, and he came to them in the fourth watch of the night. You know, if you were to ask them, hey, how far do you want to go on these waves? You're going to go on a trial. They'll say, first watch, please. <laughs> Maybe a brave one. Peter might say, no, Lord, we'll go to the second watch. And Jesus says, no, you can make it to the fourth. You're like, no, that's farther. <laughs> you know, but God will take you farther than you think you can go. You know, and that's his purpose. And what did he do? He was watching them, it tells us in Mark, and uh, verse 26, And when his disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were frightened, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became afraid and began to sink and cried out, saying, O Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said, O you a little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly the Son of God. Now I want you to notice 
that all those who were in the boat were his disciples. And all those who were in the boat were going through a trial and a hardship and a scary time. But only one of them had the courage to step out on that water. Now, only one of them. And we might even criticize Peter. Oh, you know, he honestly, probably most of us would have just stayed right in the boat. <laughs> We're like, you know, it's scary enough. I've been out on the sea in the middle of the night when it's dark and it's rough and you can't necessarily see the waves and they're approaching. You don't necessarily what's going on. And there's wind blasting. And, you know, every time there's a wave, there's the wind and, it, you know, you're just getting doused with water and it's no fun. But think about that. Only one got out of the boat. Not very many of us will step onto the battlefield and go out and fully engage the battles and the walk that Christ had intended for us to go through. We'd prefer to stay where it's comfortable. No, Lord, I'd like to stay over here. No, Lord, this is a good deal. Like, like uh, Pastor Kerry said, he got into selling insurance. It was going good. God, this is fine. We can just go ahead and ride this out right here. And God's like, nope, step out of that. <laughs> step into something else. And you know, and God constantly moving us and changing us. So listen, if, if you have the courage and the faith to say, God, okay, I don't want to be comfortable. God, I don't want the standard. I don't want the normal. Lord, I want to go out. I want to go a step further. I want to walk on water with you, Jesus. I want to, for you to be, and he was glorified in that, wasn't he? The disciples witnessed it. They came and they got back in the boat. They worshiped him. It was recorded for us. There's a purpose and a reason for God putting it in Peter's heart and stirring him up to give him the courage to go out there and to do that very thing. And so, first of all, we're faced with the challenge. Will you even embrace the trials? Will you even embrace the hardship? Do you want to go down that road? Do you want to be a Navy SEAL for the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you want to go through Army Ranger School? Do you want to go through medical school or, or whatever feat and trial and struggle that it requires for him to work in you, to mold you, and to shape you, and to conform you into that image of the likeness of his son? Because then you have power. Then you have a, a character that's very usable by him. And it can be used of him for great things like Joseph was. You know, at the point where his brothers came to him and he could tell them, listen, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. What a what amazing conduit of grace to communicate the grace of God through the person of Joseph, but it wasn't without the trials. Some 14 years of persecution he received. And so, listen, do we even have the courage to go where God has called us to go because not many do? And we look here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> and perhaps this will give us the courage to go home and to say, Lord, okay, wherever, however, and however far and however long. Last time we carried up, I think, to verse 5 or to verse 6. I'd like to begin in verse 5. And he said, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who, shone in our heart, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. I think one thing, one principle that we need to know and to have down in order to rise above the waves and the wind and the troubles of this world. Now listen, those things come from where? Our flesh. Things our flesh wants to have, it doesn't, you know, like. Our flesh is contrary to the will of God. There's the world, which is secularism around us, which provokes us to do something in a different way, contrary to the way of God. What, you know, you're, you're a young person, you're coming up in this culture, this society, you meet somebody special, the world tells you, hey, just move in and live together. God tells you, no, get married. Do you see the difference? You know, the way we act, the decisions we make, the world has one way, God has another way. They're never the same. They haven't been for thousands of years. You know, there's also the devil, and he, you know, he incites us, what, to not to believe God, to do, act contrary to God. And so, 
There's that one, one principle we need to have that I want to leave you with, is there has got to be a personal appreciation. It is just never enough to hear about, to hear from others, to recognize with merely knowledge, to do all those things. It's just never enough to know about Jesus and to hear what he's been to other people. Listen, if you want to go out and walk in the path that he's chose for your life and you want to rise above all the trials and the circumstances that come with it, you need to know, you need to have that personal appreciation of who he is. For Pastor Kerry, it went all the way back to when he was 10 years old. He hasn't forgotten. He still remembers. You know, how it came about and his own personal experience. How did Paul describe that? He said, well, we preach Jesus. And what did he say in verse 6? For God who said, light shall shine out of the darkness is the one who has shone in our hearts. In our hearts. Paul had his own account, really personal, of how it happened. He was going on his road to, you know, to Damascus to persecute Christians. And a light shone. He had a literal light, didn't he? <laughs> you know, Christ appeared unto him because he was to be an apostle. And the men around him were blinded and they couldn't see it. But he saw and he heard. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And then he went and he began a relationship. And God not only, you know, for that initial part, but from that point forth, you know, poured grace into his heart and love and kindness and patience, you know, and that reassurance. I don't know how many of y'all have been able to choose Christ and go about life your own way, but I have not. I was the kid who never stuck with anything. I was going to be a freestyle bike rider. Well, I did that for a couple years and got pretty good at it. Then I was going to be a skater. Well, I did that and I got pretty good at it. No, then I was going to be a musician and a drummer and I did that for a couple years and I got pretty good at it. Then I got tired of that. Then I decided I was going to be a drug user and a partier and I did that for a couple years and I got pretty good at it, you know, and, and I never stuck with anything. Not a school, not an instruction, not a lifestyle, not an identity, not an anything, but until Christ came along. And thankfully my wife at the same time, because I stuck with her too because of Jesus, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but uh, if it wasn't for Jesus, she wouldn't have stuck with me. Right? But, you know, I have not been able to abandon him. I remember one person in my own family, in fact a sibling, told me, Jeff, it's just a phase, you'll grow out of it. It's just a faith. I remember a pastor's wife telling me, oh, just give it some time. It'll get old, you know, or it'll, you, you know, it'll wear off. No, he it, it doesn't wear off. There's that personal interaction. There's that relationship that was started. And so there needs to be a, a personal appreciation shining in our hearts. I shared with you last time that we don't emit, emit light, yet Christ says, let your light shine. Yeah, how is that? We used to go fishing quite a bit down on the Texas coast, still do a little bit. Growing up, we went a lot. We even went down into Mexico, and we would take our boat across the bay in Mexico and camp on the beach on the barrier island, like what would be South Padre Island, just farther down the Gulf Coast. And no power. We only had, you know, white gas lanterns. That was even before propane lanterns. And, and we would camp there on the pass where, you know, the channel of water goes between the gulf and the bay and, and the tide flows in and out of that channel, if you will. And we would get out there at night when the tide would be moving and we would light our lanterns and we would have these little things called glow touts, little plastic worm on a hook. And, and we could stand there and if you would hold that tout up to the light, it would absorb that light and you pull it away from light, it would glow. It's a glow tout. And so, you know, we would charge that tout and we'd throw it out in the water and we would just slowly reel it, let it drag along that bottom and we'd catch trout. And boy, we would catch more trout and we'd have a good time. But listen, you know, you'd cast, you'd catch a trout, maybe you'd get a cast again, catch a trout. And once that tout stopped glowing, you would stop catching trout. You would only catch a fish if that little piece of plastic was glowing. And you'd have to reel it in. You'd have to hold it in front of the lantern again for a few couple minutes. And then you can, you know, cast it again. And you could catch a trout. Listen, we will not find ourselves catching fish if the light of Christ does not shine in us. If the light, and we will not have the light of Christ shining in us if we don't spend time in the light. 
There's got to be that personal appreciation. The, what did Jesus do? Did you read? He sent his disciples ahead. He went up in the mountain. How did Jesus do it? How did he sustain his ministry when he was the, his, more unique than any of us could ever? You think you're lonely in, the, in your ministry? <laughs> who could Jesus relate to? Or really, who was Jesus going to relate to? There was nobody. And so how did he do it? Boy, he had to go up in the mountain to get in that lantern and shine. And he spent time with the Father. You know, how did they do it? Y'all remember what is said of Peter and John when they were before the council and they said, and they spoke to them in such a way, they said, oh, surely this guy's been, these guys have been with that guy, the Lord. Surely they've been with Jesus because there's something about them. And they knew. So, you know, there's that issue of personal appreciation. He said in the next verse, he said in verse 7, he says, we have this treasure. What's the treasure? It's that very thing. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in our hearts. That's the treasure. I know who Jesus is. I know what he's done. I had somebody very close to me in my family tell me this last week. You're a nut. He's like, you're a nut. You can't, you know, you actually like, pray to God. You believe this stuff. And you're like, listen, I'm sorry. I've been given a little bit of knowledge that I know for a fact. And the reason I know for a fact, because it's been proven to me contrary to what I am. It's changed my life, unarguably. I've even tried to go back, right? You know, I've tried to go back and, and rebel. And, you know, God's like, nope, you're coming back here. You know, he's given me too much evidence, too much things. So there's a, a knowledge of the Lord and his glory that is there. And Paul says, listen, we have a treasure. We have a treasure, he says, is, is what that very thing is like. There was a, a funny little character in history. He was born late 19th century and he wound up living in the Black Hills of South Dakota. His name was Johnny Perrette. He, became, he came to be known as Potato Creek Johnny. Johnny Perrette had a hard life. And, you know, by the time his fame came around was just after the Great Depression. And he was a miner. He was a stake miner on a little claim on a creek in the Black Hills. And then by that time, most mining had become industrialized. Johnny still had his little mining pan which means he was po. He couldn't even afford a second O and an R. That's how poor he was. And so he didn't have anything, right? You know, and that's what he, his marriage has failed. He didn't have much going for him at all. He'd been in mining for 40 years. 40 years this man had pan gold and just made what he could barely make, went through the Great Depression, didn't have much at all. But something changed for Potato Creek Johnny one day. As he was mining on his little claim there on Potato Creek, he found a very special nugget. You know, and it was the largest nugget ever found in the Black Hills of South Dakota. It weighed over five ounces, and I think what miners loved about it more than anything, that it was in the shape of a woman's leg. And so, and that, I tell you what, that changed Johnny's life. It really did. It changed Johnny's life. And I can only imagine we don't we're not, I'm not given the account in his biography, but I can imagine that day when Johnny left his little mine and panning location there on Potato Creek. And as he went back into town on his old worn out horse and his own raggedy one pair of clothes, you know, the poor man that he was, I can assure you that Johnny had a pep in his step and a smile on his face. Why? Because of his situation? No, but because of a treasure that he had acquired. Because of a treasure that he now had that he didn't have before. You know, although it was a worldly treasure. But listen, the, the person of Christ, and in fact, he even describes it that very way. He says, the kingdom of God is like a treasure which a man finds. And for the joy of it, right, he puts it back and he goes and he sells all that he has. And he goes and buys that piece of land where that treasure is, you know, and he, he forsakes everything else to obtain that treasure, which is the knowledge of the glory of Christ. That's what it's like. Uh, Johnny Perrette, by the way, the funny little guy, he was only four foot three. And he discovered that nugget, he sold it, you know, got some good wealth out of it, and then he became, uh, because of his, you know, he like a, a short little mountain man kind of guy with a big scruffy beard, he became a tourist attraction. And into the, you know, the late 20s and the 30s of the 20th century, you know, tourists begin to come and to look at mining towns, and he was just like a character in the town. But, but that treasure changed his life. It really did, and, and fortunately, not in a bad way. 
It didn't really mess him up like wealth mess, mess, uh, messes up so many people. But listen, there has to be a personal appreciation for Christ in your life. If you are not fascinated by the person of Christ, if you're not enamored by his work in your life and the person that he is, that you've got to go back, you've got to stop what you're doing because you can't give to somebody else what you don't have. How are you going to tell someone else about the wonder and the glory of Christ if you don't believe it yourself? And if you haven't experienced it yourself. So there's that principle of it, a personal appreciation. Listen, there's the second one. You know, rising above the wind and the waves in your Christian walk is the power applied. Oh, that's great. You got a treasure. You got something that you know that you treasure in your heart. It's a wonderful truth. And but you know, you the power has to be applied. Listen to what Paul says in verse 7 and the effects of this treasure. He says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the surpassing greatness of the power, the power that needs to be applied in love, that the power may be of God and not from ourselves. Listen to what the power is like. Verse 8, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. There needs to be the power applied. What do you do with that treasure? If you, if you think that you have it, if you think that you appreciate it, and so when you, you get down that road and you find yourself, and listen, just be assured, if you really intend to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, and you ask Him to do it, and you set out on that journey to, you want to know the, the very first way, the fast, you want the fastest way to get there? Americans like the fastest way, don't we? Fastest way to get rich, right? <laughs> you know, fastest way we come out with, you know, I don't remember what it started at, but something like nine-minute abs, right? Just nine minutes. No, eight-minute abs. We got something that's fat. No, seven-minute abs, you know? Well, what, no, forget it. We're going to have two-minute beach body, you know? Like, we want fast. You want to know the fastest way to get there is like the internal imperatives. You start looking at your life, and in every little nook and cranny, every decision of your life, every place, you start honoring God. And listen, that'll get you on that pathway and into that battle faster than you ever dreamed, right? And you'll find the first battle is with your flesh. I mean, the first battle's in home. You know, you're like, man, I'm not even, it's not even being persecuted by the world yet. I'm not even getting attention from the devil yet. I'm just trying to overcome my own flesh in this battle. I mean, that, that's the beginning. That's the... That's the ABCs. You know, when you get beyond that and you walk in victory over the flesh and then you find yourself in a calling to the Lord, well, then you find the world coming against you and you find the devil coming against you and you find all those situations. And this is what Paul was talking about. This, this is what characterizes his missionary trips. I'd like to say just the first one, but it was the first and the second and the third and the fourth. It was all of them. You know, and this was the mode, and uh, poor John Mark, he got in the middle of it on the first one. He just got barely into it, just maybe a few weeks into it. He's like, nope, I'm out of here. <laughs> he's like, I'm done with this, you know, but, but he came back, right? And he was restored, saying, thank you, old Barnabas, right? And, and what he did in John Mark. But this is what describes it, and this is what he says. It's not the absence of troubles, but he describes troubles, and what are they? He said here, listen, we're afflicted, right, in every way. What they were accused, and they were beaten, and they were robbed, and they were cold, and they were hot, and they were shipwrecked. And, you know, you go, it gives us the list later on in Scripture of all these things, right, but not crushed. They weren't wiped out. It wasn't too far. It wasn't too much. They were always able to do to the next one. You know, a good trainer, a good physical trainer and a coach knows his athlete so well. In fact, he knows his athlete better than the athlete knows the athlete. And I, I heard a, a, a guy, a trainer the other day, say, John, his name is John Meadows. And he said, listen, he says, you think you know you ha how many you have in the tank, what they call it, in the tank. How many reps you have left. He says, but what you think you have in the tank is not really what you have in the tank. It's beyond that. 
by number. And the, the goal of a good coach, a good instructor, is to know exactly what that athlete is capable of and carrying them beyond what they think they can do into something further. That's what God does with us. But he never allows us to be crushed. Never gets us to the point where it's too much. What does God tell us? No temptation is overtaking you except such as, as is common to man. But God is faithful who with temptation provides a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. That's how he leads us along. And so there's affliction, he said there, but they were not crushed. Perplexed? Perplexed. I know we love to think about the Apostle Paul having this clear, precise vision through all his ministry, right? No, not at all. Yeah. We get into men who are like, I just don't know, and I, I could do this, and I don't know, but man, this is a big decision, and what if I do this, and how is this going to work out? And, oh, God, why don't you just, why, why can't it be like the Apostle Paul? And you're like, well, how was that? Because I read on their second missionary journey that they traveled something like 500 miles on foot looking for somewhere to preach the gospel, but the Spirit did not permit them. That sounds perplexing. I don't know if last time you walked 500 miles, but that takes more than a couple days, you know? And by the time you get to mile 300, you're like, God, what's the deal, you know? We came here, <laughs> we, we just wanted, you know, we just want to do your will, God. We're just trying to do what you commanded. God, what's the problem here? I'm perplexed. I don't understand, God. Perhaps that's one of the worst things, one of the worst trials we can go to when, when we need a why. Why, you know, why and what and where, God? And, and we want all these answers, and God doesn't give us the answers. And we feel like, boy, if we could just have an answer, we could go a little further, and we could do anything. But listen, he said that they, what they lived what in perplexity sometimes, but not despairing. By the time mile 450 came along on that second missionary journey, he was, I imagine, pretty confused right before his Macedonian vision that he had of the Macedonian man, and like, you know, did not know what was going, but you know what? The Lord Jesus, he's the Son of God, and I know what he's called me to do, and, and you have that persistence, right? You have that resolve in you of him. You have that treasure in your heart of the knowledge of him. And it doesn't, you know, it keeps you from that failure. It's the rock on which you stand among affliction, among perplexity, right? And persecution is what he said, persecuted but not for Satan, struck down but not destroyed. And they went through all those things. And what got them through it? The power of the knowledge of Christ. The power of God in their lives, right? That they knew him and they understood why. There was a, an Austrian psychologist named Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a Jewish psychologist in the early 40s that was taken into captivity, arrested by the Nazis, and brought to Auschwitz. Viktor Frankl was working on, uh, on a particular thing called what we call logotherapy, which is you know, the psych psychiatric therapy based on meaning of life. You know, to seek the meaning of life and in that meaning deal with your emotional problems. And... He was a Jew, and he was working on That was his work and what he was doing, and he had his manuscripts when he was arrested, and, and Victor suffered great loss. He really did. He got to Auschwitz, and everybody was sent. He had a, his wife, Tilly, was sent to another concentration camp where she died of sickness. His dad was sent to a separate concentration camp where he also died of sickness, of pneumonia. His mother and his brother were there at the death camp of Auschwitz, and they were murdered at Auschwitz. He had one sister that escaped to Australia. Viktor Frankl lost his wife, his brother, his father, and his mother to the Nazi persecution that they received. Not only that, the very last thing he said that he had, he lost shortly after he was arrested, and he was there, and he had his manuscript hidden in the lining, that the very thing, his life's work, what he was working on, and he had his manuscript hidden there in the lining of his coat, and the Nazis found it, and they took, him, took it away from him, 
And he, and he said here, he wrote, he said, I found myself confronted with the question of whether under such circumstances my life was ultimately void of any meaning. Is there any meaning left? My sister I'll probably never see again. My wife is dead. My brother is dead. My mother is dead. My father is dead. And here I am. I've lost my freedom in this Nazi camp. And not only that, they've now taken the very last thing that I had, my life's work in my manuscript. He said here, he said uh, uh, he was still wrestling with the question a few days later when the Nazis forced the prisoners to give up their clothes. He said this, he said, I had to surrender my clothes and in turn inherited the worn out rags of an inmate who had been sent to the gas chamber, said Frankel. Instead of the many pages of my manuscript, I found in the pocket of the newly acquired coat a single page torn out of a Hebrew prayer book which contained the main Jewish prayer, the Shema Yisrael, which is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. That day, God gave him something that gave him a reason why. He gave him something, right? Some sort of power to continue. And listen, you know, he, got, he survived. He actually survived uh, the Holocaust, and he got out of Auschwitz. And he went on, and he continued his work, and he completed it. It's the, the book called Man's Search for Meaning. It's pretty well known in the psychiatric world. But he said this, this is the final quote from him, he says, There is nothing in the world that would so effectively help one to survive even the worst conditions as the knowledge that there is a meaning in one's life. Who has a, I'm sorry, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. He who has a why to bear can, can bear almost any how. And you know, that is the power of ply, applied in in Christ in us, because that's the very thing that Paul gives us here. If you go back down to verse 10, what does it say? It says, always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Why? Why, God? Why, why this and why that? And why can't it just be easy? You know, well, why don't they play sun, you know, football on Tuesday, right, instead of Sunday? Why, they could just show up to a field, right, with no other players on the field, and you could just make touchdown after touchdown, after t because glory is found in the midst of opposition, isn't it? That's where glory is found, in the midst of opposition. It is the opposition that we endure and have victory over that gives glory to God. And he said that in this very thing. He gives them a why that they're always caring about in the body, the dying of Christ. Like he said, I die daily, is what Paul said. That why? That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. And he says it again in a different way in verse 11. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake. Why? That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. If you want to be any kind of shining light for Jesus, then that's part of the deal. That's part of, if you want to be conformed into the likeness of Jesus, that's part of our calling. That's part of the glory, the opposition to go through and to endure. He promised us, what did he say? All those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I think probably more than anything, most of us as Americans need to stop running away from it and start embracing it. We need to stop tranquilizing our spiritual lives with entertainment and with drugs and psychotropic drugs and start embracing that very thing. We live in such great prosperity. It's so easy for us to sidestep our spiritual callings and to be tranquilized at the, with the financial prosperity and to la-di-da our way through life. Remember Laodicea? How did they describe themselves? <laughs> We're rich. We're abundant. We have everything we need. You know what? I don't understand. God said, well, the problem is you're spiritually, you're lukewarm. And he said, in my eyes, you're wretched, blind, and naked. We do that. It's hard for a rich man to serve God. You may not think you're rich, but if you compare yourself per capita to the rest of the world, 
you probably have maybe 10 times more clothing, 10 times bigger of a home. You pay people for services like fixing your food, you know, and a waiter to bring it to the table. You take clothes to the cleaners. You maybe have somebody come and clean. That's a rich person. That's a rich person. When Jesus said, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. In those terms, in those days, he would have been, he'd been describing people with finances and prosperity like we have. That's shocking. It's no wonder, right? It's difficult for us to live a crucified life in Christ Jesus. But listen, there's a personal appreciation we have to have. There's the power applied to our lives, right, to walk in victory over all of those circumstances. And we move forward here. The last thing I want to leave you with is we've got to maintain a proper appraisal. Reading forward here in verse 12, he says, What so death works in us, but, but life in you. But having the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore also we speak. Verse 14, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and, and will present us with you. For all things are for your sake, that the grace which is, which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Therefore... He said, we do not lose heart, but through though the outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. It really, when you get into your most challenging times in the faith, in whatever ministry you're called to, I think you'll find that that's how you have to live. I don't know if you've ever lived like that before. And I don't mean something in your foolishness like you did and got yourself in prison or in a jam or in a bad spot. I'm talking about for the cause of Christ and for the sake of righteousness that you're persecuted and you have hardships and trials come upon you. And you say, listen, God, today, just, you know, get me through today and we'll, we'll pray again tomorrow morning. <laughs> you know, and Lord today you know get me through that day and i i'm fully believe that paul lived quite a number of his days like that and he said well how did they have to be renewed day by day and i think paul on a daily basis probably get up he got up and he made an appraisal of things in his life he had to attribute value to different things and make his decisions just like we are now when it comes to appraisals we're, we're a little bit of uh, some hypocrites i don't know if you know that or not but we can become hypocrites in appraisals, and I'll tell you how. The mortgage company or real estate person comes, they send an appraiser to, to come and to give you an appraisal on your property. And they said, oh, it's 300000 It's like, 300000 No, it ought to be for $350,000 at least. I mean, come on, you know. Well, then the tax man turns around and comes to give an appraisal on your property. They say it's 250000 It's like, oh, no, that's too much. It should be two hundred. you know. <laughs> and we want to, you know, how is that? Well, we always, when we're selling our home, we want the appraisal to be high. When we're paying the taxes, we want the appraisal to be low. And our, our truthful claim about the value has automatically changed. You see how we're hypocrites? <laughs> you know, we're fickle, aren't we, like that? But uh, I tell it as a joke, but there's a measure of truth in it, isn't there? Little measure of truth in there. But uh, listen, there's other things that we have to appraise. Every day you have to decide what's most valuable and you choose what you're going to do. And Paul said that very thing here. He said, uh, verse 17, For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond a comparison. Now he's using Koine Greek to carry over a, a Hebrew principle because that, that word of glory in the Old Testament, kabod, you know, which was, y'all know the word ikabod, right? Ikabod, which the glory had departed, but kabod was like a, a weightiness, a heaviness, something like what the hippies meant when he said, man, that's heavy. Yeah, yeah, God is heavy. Like, you're right, bro. God is heavy, man. Like, whoa, that's right. See, they had a little bit of a spiritual idea, concept in their mind. But he said, what? He said, a momentary light affliction. Now, this is coming from the man who was stoned and wrongfully accused and received stripes multiple times. He was beaten, right, to almost to death. 
And, uh, you know, as he says, a, a momentary light affliction, what, is producing for us an eternal weight of glory be far beyond all comparison. What is that worth? If the Lord Jesus Christ is to return, and is he, if he's to receive you into himself, and if he's to give you rewards, each man according to his work, and if you're to rule and reign with him and be in his presence for all eternity, please give me an appraisal for that, if you could. Are there enough zeros? You'd have to jump to the powers really quick, wouldn't you? You know, you know mathematics, you know, to the so-and-so power, you know, because numbers get too long to write when they get that big. And he said, verse 18, while we look not on the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You've got to get your eyes on the right thing and give the proper appraisal to things. Really value things for what they're worth. And understand what Christ has prepared. Understand the task that is at hand. There's various things to appraise here. Your, your communion with Him. Your peace with Him. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding. You abandon your walk and your communion with the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll lose that peace. You look at the King, King Saul and how he had a relationship with God at one time, and how he walked away from that relationship. And is there a more miserable man described to us in the Old Testament? I'm not sure there is. I think Job had one up on him in their ministry. King Saul, what a pitiful end. Our communion with him is something to be appraised high. Our calling in him, you know, our, our end, what is to become of us with him, is something to appraise and... Not only that, but I think a very valuable thing is to consider the job that he's given us in ministry. That he's given us a part, and you know, if you want to be clear about the Lord's business, it's to bring people unto him. That's a primary, if, he, if you give it to us in the beginning of Acts, what? You shall be my witnesses. And very quickly we learned what he intended to do, right? When thousands believed on him at Pentecost. In the end of, end of the Gospels, when he gave the Great Commission, what did he do? What are the words that he left him with? Go and make disciples. Earlier in the Gospels, in the book of John, what did he say? Freely you have received, freely give. It's no wonder, I don't think there's any doubt, what God wants us to do. He wants us to lead other people, what? To that thing, what is it? The, 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 the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, so that others might see. This whole epistle was written for that. Corinthians, I want you to have what? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Corinthians, I want you to walk in the victory, right? Of the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Corinthians, listen, I want you to lead other people, right? To the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. That's what it is, and that's what it's about, and that's the calling. Listen, it may be in a thousand different capacities, but that's the thing in which we've been called to do. Probably each in a different capacity in some way or another, but I want to share with you, in, in leaving you with this, that, oh, let me think of his name. I, sh I should remember his name. I think I have it written down on, yes, Robert Jaffrey. Robert Jaffrey, I don't know if you've ever heard of Robert Jaffrey, but he had a profound statement one time. Robert Jaffrey, born what, late 19th century, uh, was a, born into a wealthy family in Canada, and he was the sole heir to the Toronto Globe and Mail. Very big newspaper. And 120, 30 years ago, the newspapers were big. I know today it's kind of like, what is that thing? Oh, that's a newspaper, you know. But back then it was huge. He was a very wealthy young man, had a very large inheritance coming to him. God got a hold of him, changed his life, called him to be a missionary in China. And so here he was, a young man, uh, with this burden, this calling to go to China, he started learning Chinese while he lived in Canada. He learned, he became fluent, right, in Chinese. He, he was around a lot of affluency, around, had a lot of political connections, knew a lot of people, right? And they had learned that he knew Chinese, that he was moving to China. The Standard Oil Company sent Robert Jaffrey a telegram one day. This is back in, da, 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 you know, telegram days. They sent him a telegram, 
and they offered him a salary and said, we, we want to plant an office. We want to start an office in Hong Kong, and we want you to you know, head it up, and here's our salary. And he said, no, thank you. They sent him a te second telegram, and they said they doubled their offer and said, Jaffrey, we want you to do this. Double your salary. He said, no, thank you. They sent him a third telegram, and it just said one line, at any price. Jaffrey sent them back a, a very simple telegram with two sentences. He said, your salary is big, your job is too small. But seriously. Your salary is big, your job is too small. You think about what is of value in this world and what we spend our time doing. If we are to rise above these things in our life, we have got to give a proper appraisal to the value of the things that we're doing. Now listen, I'm as bad as anybody when it comes to entertainment. And I think entertainment has a place in our life. But listen, I'll tell you that for most of us, entertainment is running over us like a bulldozer in idolatrous form, consuming vast amounts of our time that should be given to the Lord. It's true. I heard Ravi Zacharias share in a, in a podcast, of course, our late Ravi Zacharias now, but I, I listening to one of his podcasts this week, he said, listen, he said, my own personal conviction in visiting with a great number of people he says, is that in the area that they're lacking is in personal devotion. They just don't spend the time with the Lord that they need to. Their gloat out is not in the lantern. They don't spend that time to bathe in the light of the knowledge of His glory. And then when they go out into the world, they don't shine as they should and they don't find themselves catching fish. I'm amazed by Jaffrey, a man who could have had wealth just by inheritance. A man who was offered, well, tell me the devil did not have his phone number. Tell me the devil did not have his phone number, right? As here he goes and he commits himself to this life in China, in a crucified life, right? Dying unto himself, going off in the calling that God has given him, and the devil, right, throwing shiny things at him, trying to lure him away. Listen, don't do that. Properly appraise what God has given to you. I can assure you that he's given each one of y'all a place in the service of his kingdom, only to find it and to do it. Let's pray. Father, God, thank you, Lord, for the blood of Christ that was not given without reason, Lord, but Lord, when you redeemed us, you redeemed us into fellowship with you. And when you redeemed us, you qualified us to serve you, Lord. So now I ask God to put it on us, Lord, your will and your desire and the intention for which you called us unto yourself, God. Each one here, Lord, I'm sure that you're not careless of. But you know each one. And the blood of Christ was with not, not without cause for them in their lives, Lord. So make us mindful of what you've called us to do, Lord, of the job that you've been given unto us, Lord, of the talents that you have entrusted to us, God. And God, give us a sober mind to wake up and to do it and to do that thing for which you've called us to do and to start producing in you, God, and to start representing you, Father. Lord, I know that we need to be shaken up and turned upside down and wiggled around and, and like your people in the book of Judges, God, that you had to send the Midianites to persecute them, to get them to sober up, Lord. I'm afraid, God, that that's what we need. Now, we don't have the goodness in ourselves that we would seek you and choose you and serve you and live a crucified life unto you, God. But I pray, Lord, in your grace and your mercy, Father, that you would be abundantly merciful to us, God, to do that thing. To make us mindful, Lord, to change our hearts, Father, to open our eyes to the pointlessness of the things of this world, God, and the kingdom and your kingdom work that is right at hand, Lord, in front of us, 
The kingdom of heaven is at hand, is what you've said. And the harvest is white, but fewer the laborers, God. Lord, don't let us be those mindful, mindless people, God. Bypassing the daily opportunity to be contributing in your kingdom. And Lord, open our eyes and soften our hearts, Lord, that we might be pricked and touched and burden, Lord, I pray, God, that you would put on us the burden for which you called us. Lord, that we would have no rest without being in the place that you've intended for us to be, that you've called for us to be. And Lord, that in us you would be glorified and that others might know. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.